Hello, my name is Andrew and welcome back to All About Russia. Today we're going to be learning about the smallest republic in the whole of the Russian Federation, the Adygea Republic. The Adygea Republic, or in Russian, Respublika Adygea, is the smallest republic in the Russian Federation, located in the southern federal district, not far from the Caucasus mountain range. It is unique in that it is entirely encompassed by Krasnodar Krai, a nearby neighbouring equal federal district, and has refused several times to be incorporated as part of it, pretending to be an independent republic. At 2,900 square miles, it is the smallest republic in Russia and the 80th smallest federal district, with the Kuban River being its northern boundary. The Kuban River is also the longest river in the republic. Now, whilst there are no large lakes in the Republic, there are several reservoirs, such as Krasnodarskoye Reservoir. The largest mountain in the Republic is Chugish Mountain at over 10,000 feet high. The land of the Republic is mixed with a mixture of mountainous and arable land, with about 40% of it being forested. The Republic is administered as nine districts, with two of these being the largest cities of the capital makeup in the center, and Adigais in the north. The capital of the Republic is Maykop, which stands on the banks of the Belaya River, which flows into the Kuban. Interestingly, in the Adiga language, the capital is called Miyakwape, which roughly translates to Valley of the Apple Trees. It was originally founded as a fort back in 1857 by General Kovlovsky, and now boasts a population of over 144,000 people. As the name suggests, the Adigya Republic is the homeland of the Adigya people. However, the very term Adigya is a slightly misleading, as it is almost a blanket term for several different ethnic groups, almost like how British is a blanket term for several different ethnic groups within the UK. Interestingly, here in the West we actually know the Adigya by a slightly different name, the Circassians. Now, I will explain this difference in etymology in a different episode, but for the moment, what we need to bear in mind, the Adigya Republic, their language, Adigya, is on equal footing with Russian. The flag of the Republic is a green background with three arrows crossing each other, symbolizing bravery, courage, and humanity. There are 12 stars on the flag as well, each representing one of the 12 historic Circassian tribes. The flag was created in 1830, when the Adigian people were in conflict with the Russians having crossed the Kuban River and was creating, strangely enough, by a Scotsman. We will, of course, explain this at a later date. But for the moment, all that's worth knowing is that the flag was adopted as the official flag of the Republic on the 24th of March, 1992. The coat of arms of the Republic is a circle with the Republic of Adigea, which is in both Russian and Adig. At the bottom, a Cyrillic RNF represent the Russian Federation of which they are part of, and sheaves of corn and wheat and leaves of maple and oak flag the bottom to represent the fertility and agricultural nature of the land. Above the Cyrillic RNF is some bread and salt, symbolizing the welcoming of foreigners to their land. Dominating the center of the coat of arms is a hero of Adygian mythology, a gentleman named El Rico. As a republic, they do have the right to have their own anthem, which is actually playing right now. For those of you who are interested, I will leave a link in the description below. The history of the Republic is very interesting. Now, we can found out from archaeological remains that there are people living in what we now know as the Adygian Republic at least 5,700 years ago. There is an entire culture discovered in this neck of the woods, named actually after the capital city Makop, due to its proximity to where the remains were found. Now, I'm not going to bore you here with all the interesting facts about it, but to briefly summarise, these were a Bronze Age people who could make this and transport it all the way to Syria. Our first written reference of the Adygians is from the Greek writers who encountered them, although they do refer to them as Moetians. After this, they came to contact with the Romans. Unfortunately, due to their location on the Fertile Valley, they have been in the path of invading Bulgars, Alans, Khazars, and Georgian princes. Now, it's worth noting at this point that with the contact from the Romans, they had had Christianity introduce them, and by the time of the Mongol invasion in the 13th century, the bulk of the population were Christians. After the Mongol invasion, 
Genoese merchants set up trading posts on the Black Sea coast. Now, this resulted in a lot of trade with the princes of the Edigean tribes, and the main thing they were trading here were slaves. It's worth noting at this point that there was no Adigean kingdom or nation as such, so each tribe did tend to raid each other, as well as outside foreigners as well. The slaving business became even larger and more profitable once Crimean and Ottoman raids began the land as well. Adigean peoples were in great demand in the Muslim world, the men for the armies of the Sultan and the women for the harems as well. At this point, Islam starts to become the new dominant religion of the people. Now, people believe this came from the princes and trickled downward, but there's no real way to be certain of that. However, suffice to say, by 1700, the Adigian people were in direct conflict with the Russians. Now, this had been going on for some time. It was very much a, a raid and counter raid, nothing more than a border skirmish. Now, this actually changed in 1830, when the Russian army advanced beyond the Kuban River. This conquest picked up great pace once the Crimean War ended and other conflicts in the Caucasus region died down, with more men available to be put towards this Adigean front. Now, a general strategy was to plant Cossacks in the land that had been cleared of Adigeans, therefore replanting the populace with a more loyal subject to the Tsar. Now, there was a lot of controversy about this period of Adigean history. It is generally accepted now that this man, Dmitry Milyutin, was the first to conceive the idea of driving out the Adigean people from their ancient homeland. As there was no Adigean nation as such at this point, each tribe that was encountered was dealt with individually and thus given a spectrum of different choices. The bulk of these were simply to either be relocated in other parts of the Russian Empire where there are more loyal elements to counteract perhaps any uh, rebellious activities or to emigrate to the Ottoman Empire or further afield. Now, again, this did vary from tribe to tribe, and some of the tribes which were more militant in the fighting of the Russians did not receive such luxury and were simply eradicated then and then. Other tribes, however, who had been fairly acquiescent to the Russian demands, were allowed to stay or even move back to their land a few years after being moved away. There is an ongoing debate and I'm sure will be politely and civilly explained in the comments below about whether this was an actual genocide or rather just the tragic result of the Tsarist government simply not caring about what happened to the Adigean people. However, millions were forced to leave their home and millions died in doing so. As their land was settled with Cossacks and other Russians and other people, of course, from the Russian Federation, the Adigean people were forced across the world and now have expat communities and diaspora across the predominantly Middle Eastern world. In 1860, the Adigean land and what we now know as the Adigean Republic was incorporated in the Kuban Oblast. Now, in 1911, oil was found not far from Makop and this led to a bit of development, it led to more people moving to the Makop as well as industry going to that region as well. After World War I, it gets a little bit tricky to explain, so I'll try as best I can. As the Russian Empire collapsed and the Democratic Russian Republic took its place, the Cuban Oblast was demolished and replaced instead with the Cuban People's Republic. At the outset of the Civil War, the Cuban People's Republic sided with the Whites. However, this did not go very well for them and there is some controversy about their actions and decisions during the Civil War, which ultimately ended up with the Bolsheviks taking power. On the 27th of July 1922, the Cherkess Autonomous Oblast was established, still within the political framework of the Cuban Soviet Republic. This was renamed for the Adigean Autonomous Oblast. On the 2nd of June 1924, the region was put under the control of the South Eastern Krai. And then on the 16th of October, to the North Caucasian Krai, as of the 10th of January 1934, it was part of the Azov Black Sea Krai. In 1962, the Tula region was added to the Autonomous Oblast, now giving it the shape that we recognise today. The Republic, as we know it today, was formed on the 24th of June 1991 and has resisted many attempts to be merged with President Akrai. Makop is a major centre for oil extraction due to the oil fields very nearby. It also has large industries in wood processing, agriculture and mineral extraction. 
Compared to other parts of Russia though, the Republic is considered poor and without access to sea or huge investment, the youth have to go and look for work elsewhere, such as in Krasnodar, Moscow or other large cities in Russia. However, with rising interest in Adygean culture and history, there is a huge potential for a tourism boom, both from other people from Russia, as well as those from the diaspora abroad and further afield. As I mentioned before, the Adygean Republic is the homeland of the Adygean people. But as is the case in several of the republics in Russia, they are a minority in their own homeland, only making up just over 25% of the population as of the 2010 census. Russians dominate the Republic with 63.6% .6 of the population claiming to be Russian with other nationalities such as Ukrainian, Armenian, Georgian and Kurdish making up portions of the population. The Republic recorded over 439,000 people as of the 2010 census. That is actually down from the last census done in 2002. As is the case in many parts of Russia, the birth rate has fallen since 1992, with 1.63 being the birth rate per woman in the Republic. Russian Orthodox beliefs make up over a third of all religious beliefs in the Republic, with another 4% being other Christian denominations. Muslims make up 13% of the population, with 9% claiming to be atheists. 30% of the people in the Republic declared themselves to be spiritual but not religious in the 2010 census. Now, this can account for those who hold indigenous beliefs of the Adyghi people, as well as, of course, other neo-pagan groups. As of the 2010 census, it is the 74th most popular federal district in all of Russia, with about 50% of the land being urban and the other 50 being rural. The Republic also runs on Moscow Standard Time. Now, unfortunately, in the Republic, as with elsewhere in Russia, drug and alcohol abuse are a large problem, with out of every 100,000 people, 14 having a drug problem and 129 suffering from alcoholism. The Republic is a safe place, although it does have a murder rate of 5 out of every 100,000 people. To put this in context, New York City has 5.5. The Republic is generally seen as a stronghold for Vladimir Putin's United Russia Party, 40 of the 56 regional parliament seats being for that party. In the 2012 federal vote, over 60% of the population voted for Vladimir Putin, with 20% of the vote going to his nearest communist rival, Gennady Zayuganov. The current head of the Republic is Murat Kimpilov, who is an ethnic Russian though was born in the Republic. His predecessor, was a native Adygean, Aslan Chakurshinov. The Republic celebrates its independence on the 5th of October in a rather cool way. What they do is they get 40 representatives from each part of the Republic and they bring and compare their cheeses. Cheese is a huge deal in Adygean culture and there's a lot of pomp and ceremony as the representatives and judges try each cheese and select a winner. That's all for me at the moment. I hope you found this video interesting. If you would like to subscribe, please feel free to do so. And of course, I include all links at the bottom as well. Stay tuned. Our next episode will be over the Altai Cry.